and we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Christian Wells, and I am the chair for the CEO Professional Development. Um, so definitely, I'm, I'm excited to collaborate with the Career Support Services Committee. So I'll let Zach introduce himself. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Zach Johnson, and I am the Career Support Services Committee Chair. I'm very excited to have you all here today. So before we get started, um, we'll do short introductions. Um, and so I will introduce our panelists, and then uh, we will get started right into the questions. Uh, so today we have with us Liz Ingrao, Amber Wing, Shana Carmack, Maurice Whitsett and Becca Gillison. Um, and so I will start. Uh, Liz is currently serving as the Associate Director of Housing Staffing and Development at the University of Miami in Florida. Liz has worked in higher education for 23 years. She's currently the Chair Select for the CEO Professional Development Committee and is also a former Relife faculty member and co-chair. Other accolades include being the former Akuo I Foundation Vice Chair for Individual Outreach and Giving and also being a former CEO Regional Rep. Amber Wing is currently the Assistant Director of Student Staff Development and Multicultural Competency at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Amber has worked in higher education for 13 years, and Amber also serves as the advisor to the Student Staff Training Committee at UNC Chapel Hill. Shana Carmack is currently the Assistant Dean of Students within Housing and Residence Life at the University of Virginia. Shana has worked in higher education for 16 years and is also a former Relay faculty member. Maurice Witsa is currently the Assistant Director for Selection and Support at Florida State University and is also the CEO DEI Chair for 24-25. Maurice has worked in higher education for eight years and was a member of the RELI 2018 cohort and is also currently participating in the 2024 QOI Leadership Academy and is also pursuing a doctorate in educational leadership and administration at Florida State. And Becca Gillison is the, currently the Assistant Director for Student Staff Recruitment at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Becca has worked in higher education for nine years, and her specific interests include team dynamics, professional development, and equitable hiring practices. Becca is also currently pursuing a doctorate in educational leadership at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Thank you, Zach. So we'll start asking some questions. And so our first question is, what are key strategies for developing a clear career path in higher education or student affairs? And whoever wants to start can. <laughs> I think I could take a stab at it. Um, really and truthfully, it's like the first thing is defining your why and what you're trying to pursue. Um, I would say for me, when I first got into the field, even with grad school, I was like, oh my gosh, training and development, recruitment and selection, DEI, all these things. But really and truthfully, it's, um, Maurice, you want to do all these things, but really and truthfully, where's your why? And so once you actually define that, being a part of committees, not just within your home institution, but also your state like level, your regional level, and even nationally, if you can, and also figuring out, like, talking to people like, hey, I'm interested in these areas. I see you doing this work. Like, can you talk to me a little bit more about how did you get into these roles? And it's also it's all about legit building your portfolio and your connections and also just putting in the work. Because at the end of the day, I am over, like, selection and support at Florida State. But I, I, I enjoy recruitment and selection. But it really and truthfully had to take me a time to actually know what that actually means. It's not just about the fun info sessions, meeting the students, it's a lot of the back work. And, you know, so you really have to be able to define that. And then after that, you'll be able to move forward. Okay, so the next question being, how can graduates, um, sorry, if anybody says something to say, I'm so sorry. I'm going to go into the questions, bless it. This is our game brain. <laughs> You're totally fine. I think that we can move on. You ready to move on? Okay. Yeah. All right. How can graduate students and entry level professionals build a professional network early in their careers? Um. So I'll I'll take a stab at this one. So, um, I think the biggest thing is to forge genuine relationships with people. So maybe you're in a, in a staff meeting or you're in a campus partner meeting, and you really like resonated with someone that you're working with. 
follow up with them, say, hey, you know, I feel like we've had an opportunity to connect. Um, can we grab coffee? Can we do whatever it means? Or maybe you're at a conference and you're watching a presenter and you're like, man, I really want to do what they're doing or I really like what they had to say. Having that genuine follow-up and creating and keeping those connections after you have that initial meeting or that initial encounter, um, I think will be key. Um, I think the biggest thing too is don't be intimidated by someone's title or someone's seasonality in the field. All of us who are still in this field want to help raise you and mentor you and help you grow. And so just because you think, you know, someone's untouchable, we're not, we're people too. Um, and so go up to them, ask that question, or maybe you have someone that you work with that knows that person that can make that connection. But I think over time, it's really easy to have that first initial connection, but the the harder part and where you put in the work is really continuing those follow-ups. So, you know, after that conference, a week or two after, follow up with an email um, and ever so often after that. So it's not just you only see this person or hear from this person at conferences. Um, and once you find that you make that connection, if you feel like it's someone that can serve as a mentor for you or someone that you feel like would be a great person to have in your network, whether it's a mentor or not, or just a professional colleague, finding ways to genuinely connect throughout the year um, so that you're not just seeing them at conferences or you're not just you know, losing that connection because of time or because of, you know, what we either can or can't do in our spaces. But I think the biggest thing is to just don't be afraid to ask and say, hey, can you be my mentor? Hey, can we chat more about this? Because I think that is how we start those as early as grad school, for sure. And the only thing that I would add is um, the importance of the connections that you make on your own campus. I find it extremely important to be able to connect with like all of the campus partners that I work with. I make it a point no matter where I work to really have intentional relationships with those people um, and not just be asking them to join me at training times um, during the academic year. And so really invest in like your campus and all of the different campus partners that you will you will come across because you will at some point need their advice or help or a resource from them. And so definitely invest in that. Anyone else? Yeah, I think one thing I do love, there is a CEHO mentoring program um, as well. And I think that's a great opportunity. So I like the mentoring and also the campus partners. I don't think we sometimes people, especially younger professionals, don't realize those, the first initial, you know, interactions you have with campus partners, they remember whether it's a positive or negative one, right? Um, so I think that's something that, you know, a lot of times graduate students or even new professionals kind of don't really recognize either. It's a small field, so you just never know how that connection can really impact you in a positive or negative way um, as well. So that, I like, I love that both of y'all hit on that. So what role does continuing education or certifications play in career advancement and how do you identify the most beneficial programs? I'll start with this one. So when it comes to educational programs, I think um, working in higher education, there is an emphasis on continued education, but that can look very different depending on your priorities and career paths. Um, we're very saturated in higher ed where it seems like everyone has a master's. A lot of our colleagues have doctorates, but if, if that's not necessarily your path or something that you're passionate about, having experience or gaining experience is just as effective for career development. Um, and I think this kind of goes back to the first question a little bit of um, what does professional development look like or career path? And I think Honing your skills in the current area, your current position is very valuable in order to move on to the next thing. Um, there are so many different opportunities out there, whether they're certification programs or, you know, a lot of us have the privilege of taking free classes um, or there's institutes that you're interested in. I would talk to people who have had experience in those areas if you're interested in that, right? Like, um, you know, if you're interested in going to Relay, talk to someone who has been through that experience or who was a faculty member and ask, like, is this right for me? This is what I'm interested in. Um, but what I would really caution, especially younger professionals, is to 
go after those certifications or opportunities because they feel like they have to versus they're really interested in that topic or getting development in that area. Um, because there are so many out there, sometimes it's better to take a second and figure out what path you are intrigued in and then go down that versus kind of collecting those accolades and those experiences. Not having to add. Okay. Yeah, I think you're correct. I think in probably you all may felt this way, but it seemed like you were kind of required to, you know, pursue a doctorate at one point. Um, and you know, I mean, I did pursue it, <laughs> but um, do I necessarily think that that could have been the only path um for me to receive that professional development? Not necessarily, because like you said, there's certificates, there's classes, there's you know, just different ways you can work with campus partners. And I think that's really important because I think a lot of people automatically assume, oh, you're going to get a doctor, you're automatically going to get a job. Hello, Ben. <laughs> and so I do think that, you know, you're going to automatically, you know, people assume that, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to be successful if you don't have a doctorate or you're not going to be able to move up without it. Um, and I think that's important to kind of recognize. It's really going to be about your experience, your connections and networking um, instead. So I do, I think I agree with that totally. So how important is self-advocacy in career progression and what are effective ways to promote oneself without seeming boastful? I can start with this one. I think self-advocacy is very important. And I think that oftentimes um, in helping professions, we are really, um, you know, apt to give a lot of credit to other people. Um, and so I think it's very important to say, no, this is, this is work that I've done. Um, and here's how I know what I know. Um, here at UVA, a lot of my job is writing down what we have done for many years and quantifying why we do what we do here. Um, and I think that that's really important. It's not boastful to say this is the excellent work that I have done. And oftentimes in this field, your work can speak for itself. Um, and so when you do excellent work, make sure you're putting your name on that. Yeah, I love that you said document. I think that's important because a lot of times we kind of get a little nervous about documenting, right? A little bit like, does it seem like a lot, but it is really just showing how passionate you are about um, the field and the career and how, learning and kind of being a better professional. So I like that as a lot. Liz, I think you had something. Yeah, I was just going to say with that, I think the way to not make it feel boastful is to create your professional brand. Your brand is who you are as a person, who you are as a professional, and what are the skills and talents that you possess that either will work for this institution you're applying for or work for whatever colleague or group that you're working with. And so I maybe we'll talk about it later, but I think if you haven't started or don't know what a professional brand is, it's really like, what is it that you want people to know you for? Is it your involvement? Is it your specific skills surrounding DEI or training and recruitment? It's what is it that makes you an asset to someone else. And so when you put it in those kind of terms, it always feels weird to talk about yourself in that way. Cause you're like, well, I'm not trying to gloat. Like I just did it when they, Zach asked me for my like bio and accomplishments, but I'm like, Ooh, okay. But at least, you know, you have to kind of use that to establish like your expertise and whatever it is you're applying or being involved with. Um, and so with that, like no one's your best cheerleader, but yourself. So when you look at it that way, it's always going to benefit you in the future. I would also add, there are times to where we do a lot of good work. And, you know, when we get a trophy or certificate, we just be like, I'm just doing the job. And I'm, I'm a victim of that. I would say I'm, I'm, I'm a person of that. I'm guilty of it. But I think there are times where we need to be like, I really didn't do that. I'm that person. And so really and truthfully, I think celebrating yourself, because just like Liz said, nobody's really going to be your biggest cheerleader except for yourself. But at the end of the day, it goes back to... Why did you do it in the first place? You know, you all are pursuing like things like I know for me, I'm, I'm pursuing my doctoral degree. That wasn't a, like that was on my list. And so I think that once I get to that cross, like that finish line, I'm going to celebrate myself because I achieved something that I always wanted to do. You know, I think it's even with the realize and even when you get your next job, that's an achievement because you went on that journey to pursue that achievement. And, you know, when people congratulate you, you know, there are times where some of us are very humble and just like, you know what, it is what it is. I just did it. I'm just here in a job. 
But I think really and truthfully, we need to really and truthfully focus on like, hey, yeah, I'm really doing the things. And I'm 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 present and I'm I know what I'm getting myself into because people believed in me and they recognize my work. So that's why I got the award or the achievement. Yeah, I think that the professional brand and then what you're talking about, Maurice, with celebrate yourself is important, right? Um, we just feel like we're always helping other people, but we shouldn't be celebrated sometimes, but we should be, and we should be proud of our accomplishments. Um, and I think that's important to kind of remember um, as well, because I don't know, it's just something feels good about whenever you said you were going to do something and then you're like, I don't think I'm going to make it. And then you do it, right? And, uh, or you get the job or you whatever it may be. And it's really a good feeling. Um, and I think others can look up to that, right? Younger professionals can see, you you know, sometimes they may say, oh, you had it easy. And you're like, you don't even know half the story. <laughs> so um, sometimes when you share your story, they're like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that. And it's like, yeah, because you can do it too, right? Um, and these are the resources that can help you get through it. So I do love that. Okay, so what advice do you have for professionals looking to transition from entry level to mid-level roles, especially in terms of skill of uh, skill development and leadership? I've actually been having these conversations, uh, specifically with some of my mentees and those that I supervise. It's, what are you trying to do? Um, a lot of them have been saying, Maurice, I want to be an assistant director. And I say, an assistant director of what? Because we all have specific areas or, you know, we're responsible for specific things. And so it's, it's about, one, understanding what you're going into. So it's like that path. So choosing where you want to go and also understanding what you're going to get yourself into. But also on top of that, building your portfolio, your brand to cater to that next role. Because we can have so many experiences and be a part of so many committees and so many things. But at the same time, are you actually a champion or are you actually a knowledgeable person in one specific aspect or multiple? And being a part of multiple is good, but it's like, what are you really trying to get yourself into? Because being an entry level, you're privileged to have all of the things. Like you're going to be a part of so many things, but what are you trying to define yourself as far as the next? But also on top of that, how are you going to be forth thinking when you're approaching things? Because I say for me, and I've told mentees this is like when it comes to being an assistant director or even up, it's more about the strategic thinking and planning, but also the initiatives that you are trying to put in place that they are that they want to see at their institution. Because everybody's going to say, these are the things that we have. What is going to make you different? What is going to make you stand out to be a little bit better than the next person? Because we're always trying to build our brands for our departments and our university. And that comes with recruiting good people. So if you're well versed in knowledge in specific areas or multiple areas, that's great. But really and truthfully, what is going to stand out for you and make you the best person possible? And the only thing that I would add is just the idea of taking your time. Um, there's nothing that says that you have to jump from position to position. If you are really liking where you are right now, um, definitely be very intentional about what your next move is, no matter like what that assistant director role is going to look like, whether it's in housing or another area. I would also say something that's really helped me is always having conversations constantly with not only like my fellow colleagues on my level, but also my supervisor of like making sure that where I feel my strengths and where I need to grow are also what other people are thinking so that I can work on those things before I go to the next level. But my biggest piece of advice would be like, don't rush and um, really like wait for that position that's definitely going to give you that next that next level experience. The only quick things I will add to is one, as Marie's kind of alluded to, if you kind of know what job you want to go for, find that job description and see what you're missing from the requirements. So if you have no budget experience, if you haven't supervised somebody, like what can you do at your current institution while you're still there and have opportunities to kind of get that experience under your belt, whether it's shadowing, sitting on a committee, working with a campus partner, like try to get those things that you may not have yet in your, in your tool belt. And then the other piece that I'm sure no one's going to talk about is if you're moving to mid-level, you're probably moving off. So what does that mean to go from on-campus to off-campus? And are you ready to do that? Um, because if you're financially not ready to move off, that goes to Amber's point, don't rush because you will take a pay cut and you will spend a whole lot of money out of pocket going to mid-level if it is a live-off position. Now, there are a lot of schools more and more with um, 
you know, with the cost of living and things that have started to put mid-level positions that maybe weren't live on before still have an opportunity to live on. So with that, if that's something you know you can't afford to move off, that you may start have, having to look for mid-level positions that include housing. That may not be something that's on your radar. So I wanted to throw that out there from a personal perspective too. And I can add one small part. Um, the don't rush is definitely, definitely true because I'm now starting to see more and more entry levels after three years saying I want to be an AD. And I was like, I'll be honest with you. It took me, it took me six years because I was three years at Kentucky and I was three years at Florida State. And it wasn't the fact that I wasn't ready by year four or things like that. It was just like really and truthfully, was I like necessarily like prepared for that next role? Did I actually have everything? Can I say I, I am actually well versed because one of my first AD role was an assistant director for residential operations. And so that was a big task and it was a big ask. And so I had to legit get myself mentally prepared, physically prepared, but also to like Liz's point, ready to move off. Because I would say I can share, I spent well probably over $2,000 to transition off campus. And I'm glad I had it in my savings. But at the same time, money, life was life. And when you are transitioning from entry level and live on to moving off, it cost. I just speak. I still live on um, and I've been in the field for a very long time. So um, it is OK to live on as long as you would like to live on. I'm going to tell you that right now. So um, negotiate is like they're talking about, because I do think. There is a timeline between people think, oh, in two years, I want to be this and three years or four years or five years. If you happen to be a residence life coordinator, supervising RAs until 20 years, like that is OK. If you're still having a, you know, getting your development and <laughs> doing that, that is fine. I think that's something that, you know, it's OK to stay at the level that may not be necessarily a movement up to other people, maybe. But for you, it is. You're still growing in the position. You're still, you know, being able to, you know, feel that, you know, great feeling of, you know, helping other students. I think it just depends on the person. And I think sometimes we do say, well, hey, have you thought about moving up? And people are like, I'm actually OK, <laughs> you know. So. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's to look at everything. But I, I love that as well. I think Zach is going to go ahead with our next questions. <laughs> yeah. Our next question uh, how can individuals build resilience and adapt to challenges or setbacks in their career, uh, such as rejections or career plateaus? I think that um, rejections are hard regardless of when they come, right? Um, but I think they can all be growth opportunities. Um, I think that career plateaus are okay. There are so many other ways to grow holistically as a person, um, if you aren't, you know, going from a uh, residence director to assistant director to director, like every three years or so, right? Um, that we've talked about certificates, we've talked about institutes. It's also okay to focus, to be really good at your job and to focus on other parts of your life for a little while. Um, you don't have to hustle 24-7. Um, and so I think that like, what, what does this plateau afford you um, during this time? And you can kind of explore that, right? So I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm always a believer that like a rejection means there's a better opportunity in the future, right? I really like that sentiment a lot. Like, what does it afford you? I appreciate that. Um, I would say that I think it's a really beautiful place to be in your career when you're comfortable, happy, and ready for the next thing. And you haven't, uh, you're not necessarily being pushed out the door, right? Or you're in a bad situation. And so really taking advantage of that to give yourself that room and space to grow in your current position as much as you possibly can and understand that it's okay to wait um, on, on what that next thing is. I know Amber talked about that a lot with your career too of, you know, a lot of newer professionals are very anxious to move up for that title change or that bump in salary. And those things are very exciting. Um, but they also come with a lot of other responsibilities, perspectives, and things that you don't necessarily see or know until you're in that position. Um, and so if you are not getting the accolades or that next, you know, promotion that you're really interested in, 
I also encourage you to look at what might be happening from like a critical lens and standpoint. Like, is there something that you're missing in your materials? Um, is there a training that you can do that is going to help you? Um, or is there a specific type of position that you would be better suited for um, with your with your strengths and things like that? So I think it's almost twofold is if it's something that's happening consistently, looking at that with a critical lens but also knowing that it is okay to take lateral moves. It is okay to um, take a position that isn't necessarily exactly what you had pictured in your brain. Um, I'll share for myself um, specifically, before I was an assistant director at Chapel Hill, I was an associate director at a university um, out in Hawaii. And I had a large uh, plate that had lots of things on it. And I was very intentional with, I want my plate to be smaller and more specific, and I'm going to be looking for that. So it's okay to take a step back. It is okay to have a lateral move. And it, if it doesn't meet like the specific idea in your brain, as long as it works for you, that's all that matters. Yeah. And to add to that, I would say um, time is the best experience you can ever get, because even if you are at a place for a while, there's always something new that's going to be put on your plate. There's always mistakes that you're going to get to still make before you move on to the next position that you can learn and grow from. So it's not a bad thing to be in a position for a while or to be in that plateau. The biggest thing is what new, what one new thing can you learn every semester or every year that can help you continue to grow until you find the right place. The other thing I would say is coming in my role from having like to liaise with HR, sometimes it's not you. There might be an internal there might be, you know, someone that frankly just has more experience than you that you got beat out. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. You may have been just as good of a candidate and with a different pool, you would have been the person that rose to the to the top of the list. So know that as you get rejections, it doesn't necessarily mean you are rejected. It there are, there, there are other mitigating factors that have to do with that. And sometimes, frankly, HR departments, depending on the institution, will flat out tell you, no, you can't hire that candidate because this other candidate looks better to us. And I've seen that. So there are things sometimes that are out of even the department's control um, that if you don't necessarily work in HR, you wouldn't know that. So since I do have that, I'm sharing the wealth. Um, there are times that we may want to hire somebody and we're frankly told not to. So know that, yes, if you see it thematically and it's happening back to Becca's point, yeah, maybe you need to take a critical look at maybe what you can do better, whether it's your interview approach, direction, skill, the way you're answering questions, maybe, you know, whatever. So if you've got to do mock interviews with your uh, mentors and, and colleagues, do that. Have other people look at your resume if you haven't already done that. Um, but sometimes you got rejected and it's, there's nothing more you could have done. Like you did your best. You were the best. You just weren't picked. Um, so I think if you look at it from that lens, I know for me that has sometimes given me comfort because I'm like, I know I, I nailed that interview, but I just wasn't picked. And so knowing that, you know, however many knows you'll get to a yes at some point when it's the, the opportunity you're supposed to get at the time. Yeah, I definitely kind of bouncing off of all of that um, as somebody who is in their third year. And so like those thoughts have started to happen about like what is next. I would just say like it's it sounds too say, but like comparison really is the thief of joy. And so like if you see everybody else around you and you're seeing like, oh, people are moving up, like people are moving to different experiences. Um, but I just wanted to echo like if you still are learning and getting that fulfillment out of the position that you're currently in, then like there's no rush. So. Um, all right. So our next question, what qualities or skills do hiring committees typically look for when selecting candidates for mid-level or higher positions? I think that goes back to what Maurice was talking about earlier. It depends on for what, right? Um, so it could be anywhere from supervision experience to experience in budgeting, to experience in operations. Um, I think it's really important to read that job description um, and match your skills, translate what you have been doing in your role into what they're looking for, right? And how does that 
hiring manager know that what you've been doing matches what they're looking for? Um, I would also add that um, a re this is going to sound super silly, <laughs> um, but has the person even applying at this mid-level position, have they read the job description? Um, have they looked at our website? Um, did they, because they're coming in at a mid-level um, position, are they asking certain questions around like, what is the dynamic or what is the culture of your department? That Those are things that I like to look for because the person is already become invested in the institution itself by just making sure they're up, up um, abreast of like what that position is, what it's gonna ask them to do. And um, hopefully they're also asking questions based off of the job description, so. I think the answer to this question is very unique to the department that you're going to be interviewing for and what they're going to be looking at. Um, just like you are going to be interviewing, you should be interviewing them and making sure that it's a department that you want to work for and that your skills and experiences are going to be valued there and put to use. Um, when we're looking at mid-level managers at UNC Chapel Hill, the things that we're going to be considering and looking for in our culture are going to be very different than, you know, Shanna is in Virginia. So thinking about like when you are applying to mid-level positions, why are you applying to that job? Like Amber talked about, is that institution going to be right for you? And then figuring out like the culture of that department because middle management is a hard place to be. I think a lot of people don't understand until you get there that you're getting kind of sandwiched. You're getting it from the top and you're getting it from below. And, and how do you manage that? And so every institution does it differently. So the things that I would say that we would be looking for, you know, perspective, teamwork, those are transferable at other universities for sure on top of those experiences and years of service that you already have to have. Um, but it's going to be very unique to that institution. And so doing your homework, that network is going to be really important when you're job searching for that next step and moving up into that like middle manager level. Um, you know, talking to people that you've met at conferences, what is it like to work there? Um, what is that institution uh, value? How are the student um, body experiences um, at that school? And kind of seeing if that fits with your vision of what that next step looks like. Thank you. What are the best ways to seek out mentors uh, or sponsors who can advocate for you and then help guide your career? I mean, I think this goes back to kind of what I started touching upon earlier. Um, but I will tell you, if no one's told you, we all get off the record reference calls, um, text messages, whatever. Um and so with that, just because someone's not a mentor or a sponsor doesn't mean that someone you may not have listed on your reference uh, list is going to get a call for you. I say that because you never know who you're interacting with that will get a call. Um, so with that, not only do you need to foster those, those genuine relationships as you start making connections, but also remember that you know, where you are applying to, where you currently work, people are going to make phone calls, especially if they may just know someone six degrees of Kevin Bacon, like they're going to be like, do you know this person? Um, and so with that, you know, that's why it's so important to be genuine and to really make those connections. I'm getting us teams call. Hold on one second. Okay, great. Um, so that you can, um, have those genuine relationships so that if they get a call, they can still speak highly of you um, because you have really worked to foster those relationships. So I think in addition to what I talked about before is also remembering that any one of us can be a reference for you, whether we intended to or not. So just making sure that you're keeping those in your circle abreast of what you're doing, what you're applying for. And I would just say that uh, if you are working at a place or you meet someone that you really connect with, um, ask them. <laughs> That's what I did at my last institution. I asked our assistant vice chancellor of student development. I said, like, 
I, I set up co a coffee date. I talked to her about like what my plans were, what I was thinking. And I asked her to, to be my mentor based off of like our connection and, and how, um, she had entered the field and her experiences and what I could learn from her. And so I would say, don't be afraid to ask. Um, and also it's really nice. It's a nice gesture also to ask, Hey, can you be my mentor? And then after that, go a step further and make sure that you have like these standing, like communication points, whether it's over zoom or teams or a phone call, or, you know, maybe you're going in town, um, where you used to work, um, at that previous institution and you meet up with that person, um, definitely build in those touch points so that you can keep that mentor mentee relationship going. But like, just ask, that would be my biggest thing. I am one of the worst people at keeping in touch with people. It is, it, I'm bad at it. I will just hermit and like, not do that. And so one of my hacks is to schedule like monthly standing things for so many aspects of my life, like down to haircuts, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, if that's you, if it's like, I would love for this person to be my mentor. I've asked them and now it's like all of a sudden three months later and I'm realizing that I have not checked in with this person. Like maybe that's helpful for you to just go ahead and schedule like standing monthly things that are already on your calendar and you're like, oh, that's what I'm doing this week because it's already scheduled. I would also like to add with mentorship and really professional development in general. I think sometimes there is this notion that it's something we receive like mentorship is something that someone gives to me or professional development is what my supervisor can do for me. Um, and while there is an aspect of that and responsibility to it, also kind of shifting that thought process as you are responsible for your own professional development and finding a way to get connected to your mentor and bringing to them like, these are the things that I want to accomplish. This is how I would like to do that. What is your perspective instead of this mentality of like, what can you do for me? It's this is what I would like to do for myself. And can you support me in that? And you are more likely to get a good mentorship relationship out of uh, that type of dynamic because you're putting the ownership on yourself and that person is supporting you versus, you know, if you have this expectation of your mentor that they're coming prepared to meetings with, you know, an agenda and they're helping develop you like that could be difficult um, to fit into a schedule for someone who is middle or upper management. And so making sure that you are also putting in that effort into that relationship is important. All righty, we're going to do one more question and then we'll open it up uh, if anyone has any questions to ask. Um, so our last question, what advice do you have for balancing career advancement goals with personal well-being, especially in high demand fields such as student affairs and higher ed? Yes. Um, know your balance and also protect your peace. Um, I think a good chunk of us all want to accomplish the world and have and make dreams come true and be like Disney World. But at the same time, we all know that we are human. We have personal lives, things that's going on in our lives. And that's also family personal achievement, personal goals, but we also have our jobs and we also have things that we're trying to do. So it's all about finding that balance, but also knowing when it's okay to say, I can't do this and I need somebody to tag in versus I can't do this at all. I'm gonna have to come back to it. So it's really and truthfully doing a self authorship, a self evaluation of yourself and really and truthfully know what you can handle versus what you can't handle. And I know a lot of people say I can handle it all, but we have to stop lying to ourselves. Like we can't handle it all. So we have to really truthfully look in the mirror and be like, this is what I can do versus this is what I can't do. I think having a great supervisor helps a lot with this. Having a supervisor who is going to help you protect your peace and help you define those boundaries, especially early in your career. Um, and having a supervisor whose boundaries kind of line up with yours, right? Um, so if your supervisor is willing to work 80 hours a week, right, then that's great for them, but does that align with, with yours? And as close, when you're interviewing for your next um, position, 
as close as you can get to aligning your your balance with your supervisor's balance, the easier that friction becomes. And I would just add building on that, as um, she just mentioned, like your personal boundaries, I would also determine what your non-negotiables are when you're job searching. So what are the things that you know you need to be successful in your role, whether that's location or amenities or benefits or the type of supervisor that you're going to have? Um, kind of identif identifying that earlier in your career will only help you in the future. Um, because once you know that those non-negotiables are present in whatever you're applying for, then that will only help you to create those healthy boundaries right in the beginning. This is actually a pretty difficult topic for me to, um, you know, practice what I preach because I am not necessarily good at prioritizing well-being all the time. Um, I definitely like am passionate and excited about my job. And so that kind of takes over in other areas. But something that has really helped me is utilizing those strengths for my personal well-being. And so, you know, being strategic, organized, setting boundaries, scheduling, um, that really helps me to prioritize what that looks like. And so, you know, I have standing days that I go to the gym and I never break that, right? Because I'm a very regimented person. So the same attention and energy that I give to my work, I deserve to give to myself, because there is always more to do. There will never be a day where everything is done. It's just not going to happen. And so when you're in this field for a long time, having that perspective of I, this is a marathon, right? Like I need to pace myself. I need to pour back into myself. And also that perspective of family. Whether I have this job or not, I will have my family. My family needs to come first. And what does that look like? But it is a balance. And so figuring out what makes you comfortable, how that is for yourself, um, and what strengths you can play on for you that help kind of achieve that in the long term. Awesome. Well, we've got a little bit of time left. And so now we want to take the last little bit of time. If anyone has any questions for our panelists that they have, then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, and so if you would prefer to put it in the chat, that's fine. Or you can also unmute and read it out loud, whichever you would prefer. All right, so we've got a question in the chat. Uh, what are some things that surprised you when you reached a mid-level role? Um, that I am now the shield between my staff and the people above me. Um, like I knew my boss was shielding me, but like I had no idea. Um, and so I would argue probably my most difficult position was when I was in mid-level because you have to manage down and you have to manage up um, while managing yourself. And so, you know, you have to figure out how to manage your feelings and then present a united front on sometimes things that you don't agree with um, or you have to protect and defend your team before it gets to your staff. So it can be very taxing. Um, and I didn't know that was a thing with mid-level uh, position. So that's probably the biggest thing that surprised me in that role. And I didn't have as much power in decision making yet as I thought I would when I moved up. Because even though I was mid-level, I still had people above me that made all the decisions. Um, so that's something I would throw out there as well. I have a question. So when you think about going from supervisor, student staff to mid-level uh, or professional staff, what is one change that you had to make because you're because of the people that you're supervising from student staff to now entry-level professionals? What is one change that surprised you that you had to make in how you supervise? The adjustment of your supervision style to meet it to entry-level professionals. Because we come in, we're supervising staff, and these are student staff. And so they are the ones that's with all the ambition, like you're their mentors, you're just guiding them. But really and truthfully, once you start supervising professional staff, entry level grads, you're you're dealing with adults. So you're like you're dealing with your peers. And so they have a lot more that is within them, like family, friends, education, 
And so navigating that and being able to be understanding because at one point in time, you was in those shoes. So it's like you really have to be able to balance that out, like that opportunity out. But also on top of that, you also have to be able to hold them accountable. So the things that they need, that you need them to do, you need to make sure that you're able to hold them accountable and get it done because you're being asked by higher ups for that same information. And if they can't get that information, they're not going to look at the staff that you're supervising. They're going to look at you as far as not holding them accountable. I would also say lean into the fact that I had to lean into the fact that um, each like uh, entry level professional that I was supervising was absolutely different. Literally, the only thing they had in common was they were entry level. And so you have to make sure that you remember, OK, what person A needs, person B doesn't need. And person C needs something completely different. And I need to be thinking out of the box on how to develop them or work with them on a certain area that they may be struggling in. And so you are definitely um, juggling maybe in one week lots of folks' emotions or their workloads or um, what they're bringing into the job that day. And so you have to be able to just lean into the fact that all of your supervisees are going to be completely different from each other. Yeah, you all may be in this one bubble together, but they are very, very different. It also changed for me when I started supervising professional staff that it was a different like skill base. So student staff, they need a lot more like, um, you know, development in those basic skills, time management, um, regulation, organization, things like that, where entry level, I think it changed for me that I didn't necessarily see myself as having to teach those skills, not all the time, sometimes they needed um, development in those areas, but I saw us more as a team. Like these are my team members. And even though I'm their supervisor, we are helping each other. I can learn from them. They can learn from me. We have common goals and a long-term relationship versus that door of student staff, giving them that experience. And then, you know, the next year, it's a different type of dynamic. Thank you. That was very helpful. Any other questions? I, I have a question. Um, so I don't I don't have this worded very well in my mind. I also just got off the phone. Uh, but um, how do you demonstrate at like a mid-level job interview the supervision skills of non-student staff? That's something I see those positions look for a lot. And at my current institution, I don't supervise like a grad or anything along those lines. So I would say what I've experienced when I've had candidates in your similar situation is what we look for is what is your philosophy on it? If and when you have the opportunity to start supervising the type of staff this position would supervise, how would you approach it and how is it different from either the no supervision you have or if you were supervising student staff or even advising like an RHA and RHH, how does that translate into supervising the team that you would be supervising in this role? Um, and so if you have an idea of how you would approach it, then I think you could speak to that um, and own the fact that you don't have that supervision experience. So, you know, saying I've never supervised full-time entry-level staff, however, knowing that this role has it, this is how I would approach supervising the team that that's afforded to me or something like that is how I would word it. Something that was really helpful in my entry-level position was that we were afforded the opportunity to chair committees of our peers. And so I didn't supervise a grad um, or I didn't supervise and another entry level, but I did chair a committee of my peers and I was able to translate that experience into supervision. Any final thoughts or questions?
All righty. Well, again, thank you all for uh, coming today. And I believe Christian will get this uploaded on to the YouTube. Uh, so we're able to reference this. And if you want to go back and reference it. Um, but again, thank you all for coming today. And hope that everyone uh, stay safe and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all so much.